Mood lighting. <laughs> wow, it's really dark. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Hello. My name is Bess Rowan, and I am the second vice president of the Doctoral Theater Students Association here at the CUNY Graduate Center. And it is my honor to welcome you to the 2013 Edwin Booth Award. So this year marks the 30th anniversary of this student-driven event. At the beginning of each academic year, the second vice president of the DTSA asks the students in the theater program who inspires you as a scholar, an audience member, and a theater practitioner? The winner this year is the all-around inspiring Woody King Jr. <laughs> so we'll be, be we'll be beginning the program with uh, by hearing from Diane Stiles, who is the vice president for theater for the All Stars Project, and then Woody G. King, Woody King Jr.'s son, and then a brief video from some of our own students. This will then be followed by Dr. Jim Hatch in a conversation with Woody King Jr. about his work. And then I will officially present the Edwin Booth Award, and we will have a reception afterwards. So without further ado, please welcome Diane Stiles, followed by Woody G. King. Thank you, Bess. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's, um, I'm very proud to be part of the Evan Booth Award honoring Woody King Jr. It's a pleasure to say a few words about someone who I admire so much. We're here tonight to recognize Mr. King's accomplishments and his contribution to the American theater. For decades, he's been a major force in establishing the black theater. His new federal theater has provided a stage for playwrights and for artists. And for nearly half a century, he sustained a vision that is both progressive and community-based, a vision that has inspired and influenced many of us, both in the commercial and the nonprofit theater. I first saw Woody King in 1994 when he came to a Castillo Theater production of Lawrence Holder's Red Channels, directed by our late artistic director, Fred Newman. It was a big deal for us to have Woody King in the house. Um, he made his way to our off-the-beaten-track uh, independent center where we were producing multicultural political theater. Woody King being in the house signaled that maybe we were getting on the radar. Um, I first met Woody King at the Otto Rene Castillo Awards for Political Theater in 1998. I was the newly minted executive producer of the event, and the new federal theater was among its inaugural honorees. I began to get to know Woody King a few years later when Castillo and the new federal were both part of a short-lived attempt at a political theater coalition called Five Points Presents. Woody directed the first Five Points production. And while Five Points didn't stand the test of time, the friendship and eventual partnership between Woody's new federal theater and the Castillo Theater has continued to develop. In 2007, we became producing partners. New Federal has mounted nine shows in association with the Castillo Theater, mostly <laughs> at our Performing Arts and Youth Development Center on 42nd Street. And I have seen Woody in auditions, in rehearsals, in production meetings, at theater events, um, waiting to see the audience at the end of the show. 
Through it all, Woody is calm, welcoming, and down to earth. When you see Woody at an event, you will also see a line of people waiting to talk to him, waiting for their audience with him. We pay homage. We thank him for the opportunities that he's given us. We try to entice him to take on our next project. Woody, coffee cup in hand, holding court in the lobby of the Castillo <laughs> Theater, is a beloved sight for me and for many of us at Castillo. Woody's a terrific partner. Um, he's a consummate professional. His smile is always at the ready. He's gracious in the face of disappointment. You always know where you stand, because all you have to do is ask, and he will tell you honestly. Um, he's a great appreciator. Uh, Woody takes joy in performance, in friendship, in creativity. You know when he's in an audience, because you'll hear him laugh sooner or later. Woody came up in Detroit. He's a working class man who never left his community behind. He fell in love with theater, reading plays in the library. As my artistic director, Dan Friedman, and I have gotten to know Woody over the years, we've been delighted to learn of the depth of his passion for developing young people, stretching back to his days with mobilization for youth in the, in the 1960s, to the support he gives our youth program, Youth on Stage, to this day. Some of the many things I love most about Woody King is that he invests in people. He takes care with his relationships. He's a risk taker. He's a nonstop, passionate theater machine, tirelessly juggling his many roles as a living theater legend, as a producer on the hunt for his next project, as a collaborator with many, and a mentor to many more. Our partnership with the New Federal Theater has forever shaped the Castillo Theater, and it's a wonderful feature of my life that I can count Woody King as a dear colleague and friend. On behalf of Castillo's artistic director, Dan Friedman, our staff, volunteers, and artists, congratulations to the, to the new Federal Theater, and most especially, congratulations, Woody. You richly deserve this honor of the Edwin Booth Award. Thank you for all you give to us. Thank you, Ms. Styles. That was great. I don't know how I follow that. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm Woody King's oldest son, Woody G. King. Um, my father is Junior, named after his father, Senior. So he blessed me with a middle name, so I didn't have to follow that. <laughs> um, my father has a great legacy in theater, uh, performing arts, um, creating, writing, acting, producing, directing. I mean, that's why I chose to go into another field, because I could never follow him. <laughs> um, my brother also, it, the stress was too much to follow Woody King Jr. So we've, we've chosen our own path, and he's been greatly supportive. Um, growing up in the house of Woody King Jr. was an adventure. Um, <laughs> me and my brother used to joke a lot. We used to have the, uh, the phone calls. Michael, remember the phone calls? Everybody used to call the house. Uh, Ron Milner. Uh, Morgan Freeman, Ozzie Davis, uh, James Earl Jones. <laughs> and we would, we would keep the messages and we would play it when our friends came in because our friends, <laughs> you know, our friends didn't believe these, everybody was calling the house looking for my father because everything was urgent, right, Dad? Yeah. Every call was urgent. <laughs> and me and my brother, we you know, we didn't tell him all the time, but you know, we told him. Um, <laughs> Like I said, growing up, my father was always an adventure, going down to the workshop and uh, at New Federal Henry Street. And the people that we met, we knew because they worked with my father. My father was always helping other young actors. I mean, some of those young actors like Denzel came through and, and um, Samuel Jackson, Glenn Turman, Kirk Kirksey. I mean, these are great, act great actors now and before they were they were always around, house parties. Um, at the workshop, I was always traveling with my father. I remember going out of town, we went to Boston, and we hung out with Robert Hooks and Kevin Hooks, and we had the best barbecue <laughs> ever. Remember that? And we went to California, we met Sidney Poitier in his hotel room, and he was talking to us 
for hours, for hours. But one of the great memories I have hanging out and being with my father was, uh, must have been about five or six. We were coming back from the theater. We were taking the train back up to Harlem. And we stopped in a bar restaurant. He had to meet, a, he had to meet someone. That's all he told me. He had to meet someone. We go into this bar restaurant. There's a gentleman sitting in the back having dinner. And I'm young now. I'm about five or six. We go in, and we sit in the back, and he's eating a steak, and my father's eating. We're talking, and he signs on a napkin. He wrote a poem for me, and I, and I lost his napkin. That's why I'm telling you the story. <laughs> it was Langston Hughes. Uh -huh. And uh, it was crazy. I met, next, I, met, I met Langston Hughes when I was five or, four, five or six years old. And I had hot chocolate. That's the only thing I remember. But I remember <laughs> he made sure I got a nice thing of hot chocolate because it was freezing. So I go to school that week, and we have to do a story. And I said, oh, I told my teacher, oh, yeah, I met Langston Hughes. She looked at me, and she called my mother and father because she thought I was lying. <laughs> but I met Langston Hughes before he passed in May of 22nd in 67. And it was, I mean, he, he made me a poem on a napkin. And I wish I would have kept it to this day. But uh, I lost it. Anyway, um, my entire King family, my brother Michael here with his wife Tanya, my wife Tina, and all his grandkids who are either in school or working, um, are honored that the DTS has given this award to my father, Woody G. King, Woody King Jr. Love you, Dad. And uh, nobody's more proud than me and us for being here. Thank you. <laughs> His influence on American theater as a whole has been so large. He is a key figure in American theater that it, I felt it was high time for him to be recognized by our department and the students of our department because he has been a major influence on all of us in one way or another. He seems like the most obvious choice because of the great many years he's been working and um, I mean just by producing works by these playwrights that's a way of disseminating their art uh, and then as as an academic our my job is to take those works and to disseminate them in a another conversation of looking at uh, particularly for me with culture and how uh, theater has cultural productions because he's been at it for so long and in so many ways of making theater of uh, compiling these plays for publication and then writing about the plays and about race and where those things uh, interconnect that it just seems like the perfect choice that Woody King Jr. should get the Booth Award. In my research into New York during the 1970s and also reading a lot about um, off and off off Broadway theater of the 60s and the 80s, um, his name just continually comes up. He was such an important figure as a director um, slash um, agitator in the lives of so many different theater artists at the time that I felt that he would just be an important person to recognize, especially since he is still working and he is still so prolific. Uh, I teach this to my 20th century theater students every year. Um, for a theater to change, uh, it needs uh, new works, receptive venues, and innovative thinkers. And Woody King Jr. and the New Federal Theater have provided that uh, for essentially the next generation of American theater. My first class in African American theater history, um, I discovered, one, I really liked the plays um, for the theatricality of them, but two, I liked them for their use of the theater as a site for resistance. In particular, I was drawn to plays by Ed Bullins, um, Amiri Baraka, and Tzalake Shange, and then later learned that Woody King Jr. and the New Federal Theater um, had done a lot to make sure that those plays and those names were known to the larger theater community. Um, and then as I continued to study African American theater history, um, I found anthologies that Woody King Jr. had um, edited and compiled the plays in multiple volumes. And then he had written a great deal on race in the theater, and so he, I couldn't get away from his work. And so a lot of my, what I know about African American theater history came from him through his writings. And then when I discovered that he was still directing and making theater in New York City and still giving voice to minority playwrights um, and creating new exciting theatrical works, that what a tremendous 40 years of um, creating um, 
a sort of anti interdisciplinary archive of minority theater in the United States. As far as being an award that's given by, you know, a graduate institution, I think it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot to talk about outside of just interpreting his performances. Um, we have a lot of material to look at, both historical and also his own writing. He is such a multifaceted um, artist. Uh, the work that New Federal Theater does educationally with young people and young audiences and bringing the arts into schools. Um, my field of research is applied theater and educational theater, and that's my background. So again, I feel a strong affinity with that work, and I know how important it is in um, sharing sharing theater with the next generation and and uh, giving aesthetic education to the next generation. I, he, he's influenced American theater as a whole so significantly, and the New Federal Theater being based in New York has been part of one of the reasons why New York has been so central to American theater development. You know, I think that inviting somebody who's been actually having the experience of producing work for so long is a great conversation to have because we can talk to him about um, really every aspect of producing theater in New York for different audiences um, over the past decades, which is something that's really exciting and for me was more exciting than the idea of looking towards um, a person who might not have the, that kind of depth of um, experience across um, communities. He's fostered so many of today's artists, both in theater and uh, in film even. You can't even sum up the influence he's had on American theater. It's incredible. All of that work and all of those um, inroads that the New Federal Theater made and, and helping to bring those plays and playwrights to the national stage, that impacted whole sectors of research by, you know, theater critics and scholars. So that is also why our particular award as the Booth Award is so connected to the work. It's established and deeply influential and uh, deeply political in like this great historical way um, that a lot of contemporary work is not yet. Um, and he should have got this award 25 years ago. <laughs> so I'm glad that he's finally getting it now. That's you guys. <laughs> now please welcome Woody King Jr. in conversation with Jim Hatch. short conversation about what we were going to do. And as you know, we have about 10 minutes apiece. And uh, I have to think of questions that he can answer or cannot <laughs> answer sometimes. Um, I want to say something about this book. It's Artists and Influence. It is a, one of 30 that we have published at uh, Hatch Phillips Library. In it are interviews uh, with artists of all kinds. And in this issue, volume 18, 1999, we have an interview with Woody. And it is a, a very good one because the person who did the interview was a theater person, a woman who now is a director in Boston at the uh, University of Massachusetts at that special center in there, I can't call the name. But 
she talked to Woody and made special effort to find out things that you always wanted to know. Uh, or, so um, it was, it was a, a good issue. And she did this in 1999 on Valentine's Day. Now, do you suppose she chose that deliberately? I don't know. <laughs> Her name was Barbara Lewis. She was an MFA graduate of, of City College. And we published it, as I, as I just told you, the following uh, year. Um, her interview with Woody begins that he was born in Alabama in 1937. I asked Woody, is that true? He said, no. <laughs> he was born in 1947. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, it's 43. No, 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 37 is correct. 37 is correct. I think uh, what Barbara had said, I was born in 1940. And uh, for a long time, she kept saying this. And I said, Barbara, 1937, 1937, 1937. See, you don't have to be careful because this information is everywhere. And Amiri Baraka will, uh, Amiri Baraka is here. He's my mentor, he's my everything. I will never, I will never hear the end of that. He'll say, uh, I thought you was my father. <laughs> okay, so no, no, it's 1937. And uh, uh, while we're at this break, uh, some of my New Federal Theater's board members are here and I am just so, so pleased that Valerie Graves and uh, Dr. Gloria Van Scott and Dr. Gloria Ellis is, are here with us. Are there any other board members here? Yeah, uh, Board of uh, Jeffrey, huh? Hey, Kay Racky is here. Where's Kay? Okay. And our Board of Advisors are Baraka, uh, uh, Jeff Burns Jr. I mean, we, we, we uh, have people who support us. And uh, I feel at this time to say thank you, thank you, thank you all. And we can go ahead. <laughs> I'm glad you took those 10 years <laughs> oh, <right>. back. <laughs> As I, I was ready to apologize because in the book, uh, it's correct, mm -hmm. but I misunderstood and uh, I thought we had 10 years off. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Barbara what goes on to write in this uh, interview that Mr. King has a talent for success. Like Midas, uh, the king, his hands uh, have, and everything he touches turns to gold. <laughs> well, not everything, but a lot of the things do. And he can attract money, pull off a show, pull in people, and it is those talents that have kept the new federal theater really alive for what is an amazing time those of you who are in theater or who have had a group or whatever, you know very well if you can last seven years, <laughs> you know, getting the money, get holding people together and the whole thing. And that he has managed to keep this one going. Now, when Barbara Lewis wrote this, she asked him, how many plays have you done? I said, 1999. Oh, he says, maybe 150. Okay, it's now uh, 12 years beyond that. How many have you done since? Well, New Federal Theater and Pat White uh, compiles the information and Pat White's here. She's my right hand. Welcome, Pat. Okay. Um, we, we went back through it and uh, Pat would say, no, no, we did this in this year. We did these moments in this year. And I think it's 285. We've done 285. Does that stand as a record in the theater? Yeah. Does anyone know any one theater that produced more under one leadership than that? No, it's amazing. And uh, the amazement is sitting right here. So, um, 
when he came to Detroit, because his family had moved up there after Alabama, and I assume it was partly because of work and jobs in the industry of automobiles. Is that right? Uh, yes, my um, oh man, my mom and dad had separated, you know, and uh, so my mom went to Detroit to live with sisters, brothers, relatives, and uh, uh, after a year or so, she came back with my uncles, and they drove and one of them 1947 cars with the sideboard and uh, my sharp uncles who worked in the factory in the Ford Motor Company. We drove to from Alabama to Detroit in 1948, 1949. What I remember is they would take turns driving. It was a brand new car. And they would say, you can't stop anywhere on the road because, you know, it's dangerous. And so we got to Detroit and we lived with my aunt on the north end. And I wrote about it in a piece called uh, Searching for Brothers Kindred. And it uh, became a kind of well-known article, long story about how music and dance and the new film industry uh, impacted on me. Now so. you <laughs> you uh, found some friends that either were theater friends or they became, and founded a theater in Detroit for a period. Uh -huh. You went around and borrowed or got people to give you fifty dollars, and you got. 950 finally, mm -hmm. and rented a place for $50 a month. And the place apparently was a wreck, but they turned it into a theater. Yes. Well, what happened, uh, uh, I think I just turned uh, either 20 or 19 or 20, and from the day I graduated high school, uh, because I went to the movies all the time, went to the library all the time. The day I graduated from high school, we were recruited by Ford Motor Company, who would come to these technical schools and um, give you a job at 17, 18 years old, really telling old men what to do. You walk around in white coats and tell people, oh, that's wrong, you're doing that wrong. And we were what was called checkers. And from 1956 to 1959, they would be laid off and we would be working. We would be working, doing, just walking around laughing. It was about six of us from my school. But the old men could tell you things. And they would tell us things. And they would warn us, it may look good now, but get out of here. Get out of here. So all that time, from midnight to 7 AM, that's when I work. And I would go to the library at 8 a.m. That's when the library stayed open until 9 at night. And the librarian would bring me books and stuff like that. And one day, I discovered Sidney Poitier. And my world opened up. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do that worse than anything in the world. But Sidney Poitier led to the American Negro Theater. The American Negro Theater led to Ozzie Davis and Ruby D. Ozzie Davis and Ruby D. led me back to Lloyd Richards, who was in New or Detroit and Wayne State and all that. So Wayne State, I went to Wayne State, right? Because that's where Lloyd was. And But they wouldn't give us no, they wouldn't let us be in no plays. We could be the buddy to the lead. And a group of us said, well, well we want to play the lead. We don't need no buddy. So we said, we got to start our own thing. So we started our own theater hall chairs and rented this bar. And I started going to drama school because I thought, well, if you read and everything leads to that. I went to this drama school, Willoway School of Theater. So I walked in the door. I was talking to this old lady, Teresa Wade Merrill. We started talking about noon. By 8 o'clock that night, we finished talking. <laughs> and she offered me a scholarship. She offered me a scholarship plus, I think, $3,700 
with two, $200 a week just to go to school because she thought, um, so I was there four years and we built the theater. And while we were there, uh, the Teresa Wade Merrill and turned me on to the Bonstells, turned me on to Evil Galleon, turned me on to Harold Clurman, turned me on to Ilka Chase, Basil Rathbone, who all came there to teach. And so they would always say, especially Harold Clurman, you gotta go to New York, you gotta come to New York. So eventually, when I graduated, and we built a theater, and we had three or four hits, by the way. I mean, a hit. Anybody know what a hit does? <laughs> a hit is Dutchman. That's Baraka. A hit is for color girls. A hit is what the wine sellers buy. A hit. So you get a hit. You really don't have to work for five or six years. So I had a hit. We came to New York, and Michael and Jeffrey and everybody. Michael was born in New York with Jeffrey. So one of those hits bought us a house. So we were the first black families. We had this huge 20-room house in Harlem. <laughs> and so, man, ABC, NBC, and everybody was shoot, film this new house. And so we got popular. So Concept East told me, look, you always got to have account an accountant. You always got to have a bookkeeper. You always have a good guy, have a good lawyer, and I found him in Jay Kramer. Jay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you learn. And, and from 1968 to now, Jay Kramer, who is here, has been watching my back. So, anyway, you know, it's all those things where you come out of a, the settlement movement, radical left, really in Detroit, something called the Franklin Settlement. Then the Henry Street Settlement in New York. And um, one of the early, uh, a dad met me uh, at a different place. One of the early interviews, Dan Friedman did an interview with me in the Alliance newspaper. And I couldn't believe there were people who were thought like the people at Franklin Settlement and Henry Street Settlement and Mobilization for Youth. And then I went back and uh, uh, Bert Beck said, oh yeah, 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 Dan Friedman, Dan Friedman. Dan. So in my waning years, I reconnect with an institute that Dan Friedman founded, I mean that uh, uh, Fred Newman founded. So, so the concept, be, all those places lead, you know. Research is like a drug. If you get Sidney Poitier's name, you're going to get Harry Belafonte's name. If you get Harry Belafonte's name in Sydney, you're going to get the American Negro Theater. So you go through all this, and you find out everything you can about each one of those people. So if Sydney could get nominated for Academy Award at 26 and was sleeping on rooftops when he was 17, and I had all these degrees, there was no reason I couldn't do what I wanted to do. So from 16 to now, <laughs> I've, never, I've never not had a job. And I advise young people to, I just love it when I look at these people, PhDs in theater, you know? And we had to go out there and we didn't have no place to go and get that PhD, man. Oh man, I just think it's great. And Jim Hatch uh, pioneered in so many uh, young artists getting those PhDs, you know. A couple of questions in that round you just covered. Um, did you, the first theater, or the first one that I know about, in Detroit was one outside where the rich people were called Willoway. That's where I went to school, yeah. And it was white. Theater. All white, yeah. All white. And you were there as an actor? Yes. With, and you had one other black person in the group? A woman? Elaine Jackson. Elaine Jackson, okay. Mm -hmm. She's and, a playwright. She lives in New York. Yeah. So uh, well, how do you cast two black actors in an all-white neighborhood and it's wealthy and so on? Um, 
And that gave a great insight to you about acting. You remember? You decided, yeah. wait a minute, how am I going to get on stage with a white woman? Because they, they were not going to let that happen in Willoway. <laughs> <laughs> that was not going to happen. So uh, I could do a monologue, you know, so I started doing monologues, you know, Richard III. I started doing monologues from almost every conceivable play. But uh, uh, thank God for something called the Black Arts Movement. The Black Arts Movement began to uh, really change the American theater. And the Black Arts Movement really gave us the mentorship in Amiri Baraka. Amiri Baraka, as some call it revolutionary, uh, Black arts movement that moved from the village. Now he moved from the village to Harlem. And uh, it gave us something to look forward to, something to uh, really deal with literature, deal with poetry, deal with art in the ways we had never dealt with it before. And uh, so our early knowledge of uh, Ibsen, Shaw, Shakespeare, Hemingway, now began to take shape in Willard Motley, began to take shape in uh, Richard Wright and poets, uh, and artists, and the spoken word. And uh, so uh, that movement really opened me up for a new kind of literature, a new kind of uh, uh, theater, trying to make, because a poem is a song. And if you get 23 songs, and we as an audience really love music, then you can have for color girls. If you, you know, uh, me and Barack, I used to laugh at this because I had the last poets. But they had dashikis and afros, and they, so everybody was afraid of them. <laughs> and Barack always speaks his mind. We tried Barack in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. We tried Baraka Nation Time. We, we did records for Motown. We, <laughs> we, could, we could sell. And this sister said, Woody, Judy Deering. Everybody know Judy Deering. She's one of the best designers in the world. Uh, she says, look, everybody loves beautiful black women now. This sister's saying the same thing. Let's put some girls up there. <laughs> <laughs> And it ran for five years, y'all. <laughs> we end up in, we would be in Australia. People be, oh, knocking down the doors. We did it, we did it in London, man. We, was, we, we were everywhere. Uh, so the theater, uh, and I think the PhD students can speak on this better than I can, would take you to places that you would ne I had no idea that I would end up in Brazil, I would be in London, um, or Japan, or, I mean, learning these cultures, it's all about a play. The play did that, you know. You're giving us very good insight into how you became what you have. And uh, I have another one that is a little mystery to me, and that is I read that you went to uh, Sydney's movie. What was the name of that? Um, the Defiant One. Defiant One. And you went back, and you went back, and you went back. Yeah. And you saw it over and over. Now tell us why you did that and what you saw. Okay, Sydney uh, on screen looked like me. And I'm saying, wow, man, uh, in Detroit, uh, it was the music, it was the music, it was uh, uh, the miracles. Uh, Bobby Rogers and the miracles looked like he was my friend, you know. Uh, Eddie Kendricks was my friend, so they looked like me. So this new kind of thing where the black arts movement began to take hold, I think, uh, and grasp us to do our own, do our own. So Sydney. Uh, had this image, and he, this image in the Defiant One was a guy who could not read at 17, 18 years old. 
and lived on rooftops because he wanted to act. He was looking, searching, which we were all doing, searching for a way out of this, uh, this uh, bind that we found ourselves in because our parents had come from another generation and this new generation, we were, we had to take a leadership position even though we didn't want it. We had to, we had to grasp it. So watching Sydney led me to the American Negro Theater. And then when I sat with those people in the American Negro Theater, Fred O'Neill, Abe Hill, I mean, and they were older gentlemen, and they saw that I would listen to them. And uh, if you listen, people will start to tell you things. But if you go in talking so much about yourself, blah, 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 you know, hey, they, they, they saw like cut off. So it's amazing when Jimmy Baldwin says, uh, we got a party going on tomorrow night. Why don't you come over to the bar? Or Miri Baraka says, man, I'm having something at my house. You never thought in a million years that this would happen, you know? But if you read The Fire Next Time, if you read Nobody Knows My Name, if you read and you know these uh, uh, pieces, uh, if you read The Screamers <laughs> by Mary Baraka, if you read uh, Mask Angels, one of the greatest poems ever written, Mask Angels. And my, my autobiography, by the way, is be called, I'm going to use a line by Mary. You may see my name, but the ghost got the dough. <laughs> 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 you see my name everywhere. But the ghost got the <laughs> That's a great mask angels. I mean, you know, you know, I gotta tell y'all, you know the way literature is. I read from midnight to maybe four in the morning, then go to sleep on it. I'll be reading Mask Angels. I must have read five hundred times. And you all said I start laughing. I start laughing so hard. <laughs> Woo, boy, okay. But anyway. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, in the early part of my career, took me to the Russian Tea Room. And here's a guy who didn't even graduate high school, who done taught himself, who, I mean, it, was, it had to be 66, 67. We were in a Russian tea room, and he only drank tea. He says, I got a picture coming up, and I think I'm going to lose 25 pounds. That's discipline. That's power, you know what I mean? Because that's what he knows would sell him, you know what I mean? So, uh, and also, okay, I'll tell you, this is another thing about it. Relationship with stars, relationship, like if Denzel and I are talking in a restaurant, blah, 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 you know, everyone swears we are talking about something is earth shattering. <laughs> and he would say, uh, did you get uh, 12 Tribes of Hattie yet, that new novel? That's all he's saying. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's never all the things that appears, you know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very good. I think was, that cleared up that mystery. Huh? Okay, one more question. How many question. minutes? <laughs> one more minute, oh dear. No, 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 one more question, one more question. <laughs> well... I'll tell you that he has two honorary doctorate degrees. And one was from Wayne State. You must have, they wanted to, you to forgive them, I guess. <laughs> yeah. and, and you did, I suppose. And the other was the uh, one in New York City. 
Um, Lehman College. John yeah. John Jay, right, Pat? John Jay College for Pat Justice. Wooster. Where's Pat? You know, you're right, right, right. That's right. Pat knows him. Yeah. <laughs> Brooklyn College, yeah, Pat. Yeah. So you not only can call him doctor, but you can call him doctor, doctor. <laughs> and that recognition, uh, I'm glad it came even coming late, uh, shows some kind of uh, coming to an awareness that America has changed to a large degree, at least part of New York City. Um, well, we got one second left. No, 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 one more question. Okay. Uh, you got a job early with the uh, mobilization for youth in Manhattan. And you did very well because somebody, on the basis of knowing you, asked you to form a theater at the Henry Street Settlement. Mm -hmm. Well, mobilization for youth, uh, I started there in 1965, 66. And uh, I had something called a cultural arts program where we had uh, 50 students, uh, 10 in dance, 10 in music, 10 in art, and 10 choral singing. And we paid them. We got a, a, a Adam Clayton Powell helped us get uh, $800,000 uh, to uh, run this program of mobilization for youth. And uh, that, by the way, that's why I really admire uh, All Stars and Castillo because they have a youth on stage. New Federal don't have the youth program anymore. So uh, uh, we presented dance, music, and eventually film. And we went all over the world. Uh, back in those days, you know, you could promote uh, a flight to Rome, the Festival of the Two Worlds. We took 40 kids there. We went to San Antonio. We took kids there. We took kids to Hemisphere in Canada. Uh, and uh, we were unbelievably popular with the Office of Juvenile Delinquency, uh, Health and Human Services from the government. And mobilization director was a guy named Bert Beck, who took a shot with me, with one degree. You know, he took this shot. He said, we'll give you this uh, job at 25 or 26, you know, running an $800,000 program. But I was, you know, and so that I learned in Willoway, get some accountants, get bookkeepers, get attorneys. So while all the other institutions like How You Act and bed -Stuy and all that was pilfering and stealing money, we had uh, an unbelievably successful program. And Bert Beck was offered the directorship of Henry Street. So with that, of course he was going to ask me to come. I mean, I was his, you know, his cultural person. So he said, come over. And I said, well, I just I want to get out of this training thing. I said, well, uh, I want to introduce you to Mrs. Edward R. Murrow. And she became an unbelievable source uh, of New Federal Theater in its first three years. And she passed on. But uh, the mixture of uh, uh, very high level African Americans and very high level uh, Henry Street board members, predominantly Jewish, who really saw this theater uh, as something that could really work, we did do the new federal theater that was supposed to be um, uh, an offshoot of the old federal theater, where it would be free to the public. And it was free to the public for the first two or three years. And we did uh, Asian theater, black theater, Hispanic theater. And we had hit shows. All right. You named your theater the New Federal, Federal theater. theater. And that uh, name lasted. You kept using it. You never stopped it's using it. It's still the New Federal Theater. Yeah. <laughs> so that is um, a tribute to part of your going to the library all those years, I yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. you weren't old enough to have seen Federal theater shows, I don't, did you ever see no, one? No, 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 no. But you gotta understand, I became very close with Harold Clorman. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came to New York, the American Negro Theater, 
had all these people who had been a part of the old federal theater. And I'm telling you, you know, they really wanted, and Jeffrey, I tell you, they, they, these older gentlemen and ladies, they'd be by the house, we'd be talking, we'd be drinking tea and coffee, you know, and I would listen. That's it, right? <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Good. <laughs> He's going to write his autobiography. He's already working on it. <laughs> this is very important. very important. Well, now it is my honor. Woody, don't go too far. <laughs> it is my honor on behalf of the Doctoral Theater Students Association to present this, Ooh. the 2013 Edwin Booth Award to Woody King Jr. for coming. Please join us for a reception and please congratulate Woody King Jr. yourself. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.